how is this? Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much for uh, in inviting me to your conference. I'm really pleased and honored to be here and to be with Bob and your wonderful staff and, uh, and back again at Watermill. I haven't been here for some years since before COVID. Um, but uh, I wrote this piece in 2011. It's uh, basically about the trees of Watermill. It's called Tree Lines. I can speak a little bit about it um, afterwards, but for now I'll just read it. It's very short, um, and I'll tell you the circumstances of it uh, later. Um, one Saturday in March, I went for a walk in the Watermill Woods. Most of the trees were bare, their elemental shapes clearly visible in the windswept trunks of pine and beech turned a withered gray in the Long Island air. Tall, thin oaks lose their leaves to form a soft carpet beneath my feet, a mulch and a muchness. At Watermill, the grounds act as a kind of book of nature, its pages bounded by vistas of garden, field, and path. There I walked round and round, stepping on crushed stones and down terraced stairs, flanked by billowy grasses gathered up for the winter like rows of fertility goddesses. Through the joint of the building, its meditative heart, I saw distant trees framed in open passageways, their tangled branches, so many slender drawings in the open air. Trees are outside and they are inside, inside out. In this theater of illusion, they live among the furniture visible through grass, glass doors the sight of trees beyond bookend a long corridor of interior rooms calmed by the solitude of sculpture. Whenever I look through a window, trees were framed in the reflection of its glass panes. Gertrude Stein would probably have said it was windowful, to use one of her capacious words. Wandering along pathways in the woods, I found myself in the company of spirit guides in the shape of large clustered in discrete sites, as if they were other populations gathered into the artistic life of the Watermill community. A group facing this way and that seems to be conversing. Others, tall and proud, conjure a different species of wisdom in the forgotten signs carved onto their wooden chests. Here and there are the sacred coffin lids of ancient cultures and continents, a poem to the cycle of time. Even a spiritual ladder has its own setting. Bob the traveler, Bob the lover of lost civilizations, he places well-worn totems far from faraway islands by Long Island walkways, designing sight lines for strollers. Footsteps on stone and leaves and soil tell time in organic matter. Everything matters. A forest of myth, a place of dreams, and over there a stage. How the landscape makes a play. If when I am in the woods, the woods are not in me, what right have I to be in the woods, said Thoreau. Here there is safety and the watchfulness of owls. Mystery when it is dark, birdsong in morning light. A chipmunk makes its home in the trunk of the tree. Now and then a cloud above in the shape of a grand piano floats by. Archaic symbols and the future language of art <clears throat> floats upwards toward the network of branches that start high above top trees to give them a swaying lightness in a certain wind. Spectacularly balanced, a funeral post from across many seas towers assuredly in the field of stone, now a space of revelation. How the figures make a composition. Inside Watermill, a prominent place is given to the library, a word whose origin is, is related to Liber, book, which refers to the bark of a tree ancient civilizations once used to write on. The transformation of a tree into a book fashions the entracts of Bob's monumental project, The Civil Wars. 
Trees are everywhere in his theater of plants, indoors, outdoors, floating, right side up, hanging upside down, simply a branch or a trunk, an evergreen. The silent Raymond appears on a swing in the woods of deaf man glance in the forest created for the anniversary of Berlin's 750th year as a city, trees grow indoors. A young woman stands in a tree trunk in Orlando. One forlorn tree appears in Hamlet Machine. Sometimes in history, knowledge grows on trees. Here is Bob's Arbor Philosophica, rooting him to the great depths of human consciousness tree symbolism, the teller of time, tree of life, tree of light, celestial tree, the measure of humankind in its epic of life and death and afterlife, the inverted tree of the Upanishads and Kabbalistic writings, a magic tree, abiding presence in his cosmos where spirit and earth mirror each other. Oh, elegant cypress, what secrets flow through your wispy leaves? Bob, theater of plants, Bonnie said. Tell us about watermill and the plants and the trees. Watermill plants. About the trees, about your gardening in watermill and the trees and plants. What do they mean to you? I came to hold it close in the early uh, 60s to New York from a small town in Texas and I came uh, to New York and to study architecture but I think the main reason I came was to be in New York <laughs> that it was so exciting to be uh, in this city that uh, where many people from all over the world lived. And uh, driving in to Manhattan uh, five weeks ago when I arrived from, from Europe, I had the same charge, excitement, seeing that skyline and thinking that so many people live so close together in this community. and. How exciting it was to get in an elevator and be with people from all over the world. Uh, it was so different in the community where I grew up in central Texas. But towards the end of the 80s, uh, I began to think uh, about having a studio not in the lower Manhattan, but having a studio that would be outdoors with light, space, and trees. And um, so I began to eventually relocate um, to Long Island. And It's amazing uh, to look out this window and uh, look out the windows and see a tree. <laughs> and uh, I remember in the 60s coming to Long Island and I was at a friend's house in Amagans rather frequently. Um, they had these beautiful cedar trees and the movement of a tree. Well, just look out now if you can see a tree. Unfortunately, our neighbors cut <laughs> most of them down a few months ago. But is that, uh, <clears throat> there's nothing like it, no? The, the movement of that tree. And, uh, When I first started working in the theater, <clears throat> and I had a, 
uh, first major work that was seen in Paris in 1971, people said, oh, you must uh, be influenced by the Japanese theater, the formal theater of, of the no. She goes back to the 14th century. And uh, I said, no, that I, I was unfamiliar with the, the no theater. And, but in the no stage, there's very little except um, a painting of a tree, of a pine tree. And I think that's when I first seriously began to think of the of movement and uh, as long as that tree was alive it was moving and how in the theater as long as we're alive we're we're moving and uh, it's so different to have a studio here uh, on Watermill and Long Island and surrounded by trees is very different than having a studio in Manhattan. Uh, the stone that is here at my right is called a tree of life and it's from the 18th century from an island in Sumba. Um, and the idea of a tree of life is that uh, the roots and the branches are one body. So that they go down and they go up and spread out. And uh, But it's also become a, a way of thinking for me. How do you stand on a stage? How does a tree stand in the ground? Uh, the roots go deep and the branches go high. Um, Japanese believe in the theater that the gods are beneath this floor. <clears throat> and Bonnie's right, Gertrude Stein talked about her plays as being landscapes. Uh, landscapes of trees. Bonnie, um, what led you to write this piece? Uh, I guess around 2010 or so, or 20, 2009, um, I was asked to contribute to the German book um, that was uh, uh, produced for uh, Bob's 75th birthday, published by Daco Verlag in Germany. And uh, I've seen it on the table around here and there as we walk through Watermill. Um, so I was asked to contribute to that. And I thought, well, what, what would I do? You know, <laughs> I, I am trying to get an idea. And, and I don't know, somehow I came to the idea of coming out to, to Watermill, because the book was also a celebration of Watermill uh, as a laboratory for performance. So I came one day in March, actually, and it was kind of cold. And, uh, and I just uh, walked around a lot. Um, I w walked through the building as much as I could, through the different rooms. Um, of course, there were many different pieces of uh, of uh, world uh, sculpture at that time, and the settings were often different. Um, so 
I, I took a lot of photographs and I just tried to be observant about the space. I noticed, of course, all the windows. Okay, I, I, I noticed all the windows everywhere and how you could see the trees through uh, any window that you looked out of and how prominent trees were. I like trees myself. I have a. Um, a I see uh, the batteries. Maybe okay. use this phone. Okay. I have a house upstate New York, and I have a lot of old trees, and uh, I I in enjoy watching the trees also move and sway in the wind, but. Uh, and, and also sometimes like a giant, giant tree will be uprooted with the wind. You wonder how this can happen and how a, uh, an old, old tree over 100 feet high can fall over. Uh, so I, I, I'm very interested in trees and plants and gardens and I try to visit them wherever I go. But um, that's how I came to do the piece, I, uh, which was pu then published in 2011. Uh, I just did it from, um, walking around the building, observing and looking at the garden plans, looking at the trees, and knowing how prominent trees are in, um, in, your, in your work. Um, so that's what gave me the idea to do this piece and make my contribution to the book in this way. Um, Bob, a question. Someone mentioned it, that your father did landscaping, is that? Was he a gardener, too, next to being a mayor and a prominent figure? I think uh, <clears throat> my father's favorite time, my father was a, a lawyer. Uh, his favorite pastime or, uh, was uh, gardening. Um, he always uh, had a vegetable garden. And uh, so I think I took uh, my love for nature and uh, in the 90s, uh, I had Robert Wilson, uh, uh, they were saying, oh, he's not interested in literature, he's not interested in words, he's only interested in uh, images and pretty pictures. And uh, so I, my mother used to say, uh, they ask you in school to jump two feet, jump five. Uh, said, okay, that I would try to learn Hamlet and learn all the parts, all the roles, from Gertrude to Ophelia to the king and all of them. And it took me four and a half years to learn most of the texts. And uh, they made a T-shirt, I think, in 1995, 96, that, I kept saying, well, I'd rather garden than learn Hamlet. <laughs> um, and it was true. <laughs> uh, and uh, frequently the, um, the staff and people here uh, said, oh, you know, Bob would rather plant uh, blueberries than to have a workshop. Or, for a production, it's true. <laughs> Little Bob spending all our money on gardening, it's true. <laughs> um, but mm, gardens, uh, plants, uh, I think, uh, uh, affect our s spiritual side, and. Uh, so I'm grateful to my father for starting me out as a, as a gardener. Um, Bonnie, you said Bob's work, seeing his work being in communication changed your way of writing, of editing. How does that, how does the theater director change your writing and editing? Tell us a little bit. Yeah. Well, um, since, uh, since I consider myself an essayist, um, I often, uh, especially in the arts, uh, I even though I'm, I I've done other kinds of books, in fact, I have a gardening book as well, 
um, but it's a collection of garden writing, and um, uh, and so I'm I'm interested in gardening, and I still and I do garden myself. But as an arts writer, I generally write about artworks, and so in a way, you, you know, there have to be artworks to attract you uh, to write about, and then hopefully they will challenge you and help you become a better thinker and a better critic. I, I, I just at the at a at the bottom level in a, in a way the in the beginning or introductory way uh, I think writing about performance and certainly writing about Bob's work throughout my professional life I learned how to do performance analysis and by that I mean working with space and time and gesture uh, and light and, and and dealing with those object those things not just um, you know themes and uh, plots or drama, but uh, but the actual aesthetics of performance. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> um, at various stages, starting in the 70s, the work had an impact, of course, obviously, in the theater of images. But sometimes people misinterpret the theater of images because, in a way, all the things that are analyzed are texts. So the letter, a letter for Queen Victoria, w was an analysis of the text in the same way that with Richard Foreman's work, also in that volume, and Lee Brewer's, I analyzed the text. The, that volume had my introductory essays, and it had three texts. So people sometimes forget about that, um, and it was never anti-text uh, <clears throat> that uh, that book. So I so I began to learn as a as a young person in my twenties at that time because that book came out in 1977, and um, I, I I I really lear learned and had to had to develop a vocabulary because when new kinds of visions uh, uh, artistic visions appear, uh, critics don't have to figure out how to deal with them, just as uh, teachers have to do to learn new work. So you learn by going and seeing the work. You may make mistakes. You, hopefully you start out with the best of intentions, and then you learn how to think about work and how to develop your perception and what kind of vocabulary. My, my main um, ideas actually were always around trying to find a new vision for criticism. That's why we had started the journal in 1976, also a performing arts journal. It was always about a new vision and trying to understand new works. But then as the years went by, any time I had a new book or whatever of my uh, arts writing, I, I always was writing about Bob, uh, <clears throat> Bob's work. <clears throat> Um, one other way was with uh, ecologies of theater. Uh, again, through these different kinds of issues about biodiversity and ecology, the kind of different things in his work about climate, weather, the fact that they take place in the desert and the beach and the forest and the woods. Um, people hadn't been paying that much attention to it. Or all the animals in the work made me see that there, this uh, this kind of theater offered a kind of a, a bestiary of work, and I was telling the story yesterday. Um, one time when I, when Bob when I went to see you uh, perform Crap's last tape, we had a discussion about it, in which suddenly you were talking about how you learned a lot about acting from watching animals, and it stayed in my mind. And years later. When I was in Italy, I went to the Villa Panza where there was a video, video portraits of owls. And then I realized that, well, in your theater, nobody uses the head and the neck the same way. An owl can turn practically 270 degrees. And if you look at the, look at the way the performers are and use their neck, they're turning <laughs> almost as much as an owl um, as possible. So some of these things I, you know, just sort of develop over the years. But the notion of ecology and ecologies of theater is a is a big issue because of the biodiversity in uh, in his theater and the uh, the reproduction of, and the and the different kinds of species, the flora and fauna, and uh, humans that live together. Um, another aspect, uh, years later in the 90s, uh, I began to be very interested in performance and drawing, which is not a topic that people pay attention to in theater. 
and, and it was late to actually come to um, uh, visual arts as well. Um, so in the journal, I started a uh, series on performance drawing, and I asked Bob for a contribution, and he gave us the, um, the drawings from Three Penny Opera. And so over the last 15 years, I have continued to have performance and drawings because I discovered that so many people in dance and visual arts and performance um, have a, a drawing practice as part of their live art. So th that's another area that opened up for me. Also, <clears throat> the idea of the archival. If you take a piece like uh, The Forest, which I mentioned, the one that was done with uh, David Byrne, when I began to do the research, there were texts inside of texts inside of texts dispersed over hundreds of years of European literature and um, arts um, text. Um, and the same thing with images and stories and myth. So I realized that Bob's work was really about the archive of world civilization of texts and images, and that the archival was a new kind of chronotype in theater. And it went way beyond the ready-made or uh, uh, you know, appropriation or something like that. It was a whole world, world view. So that uh, you know, was another uh, thing that contributed. Um, yeah, no, that is also very significant and important. Bob, in your work, Guadagna Terrace, a story of family and change, you worked with nature and trees and outside. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I think uh, something uh, Bonnie mentioned to me at lunch, uh, Etel Adnan. Uh, uh, Etel was a philosopher, she was a writer, a painter, a, a person of many talents. And I met her when I did The Deaf Man Glance in 1971 in Paris. And, said, I came to see your play. This was a work that was seven hours long in silence. Said, I've seen it three times, and I want to come back. And I said, oh, and so what did you think of this work? And she said, it gives me time to think and to dream. And I think that's the same as these windows that look out to nature that that's um, <clears throat> rare that we can sit in a room and look out a window and in a sense that's what theater is like it's, uh, it's uh, something like these black frames that surround uh, a stage and uh, that stage is, uh, can be like these windows that look out on trees. It's, uh, theater can be uh, a time uh, to think. Uh, it can be a time um, to dream. And um, I went to see a play last night. Mm -hmm. It was great, it was entertaining, it was, but there was no time really to, to think. It was all speeded up time. And uh, there were actors, I wrote them a letter this morning and thanked them. And uh, I said last night to Keith, McDermott, who's here, I said, I'm glad I went. I learned a lot. 
Uh, but it gave me more uh, confidence and a confirmation to do what I'm doing. That I think one reason I, I didn't like and still don't like so much uh, Broadway theater, uh, operas, is that they're so afraid of losing the audience. And that every second last night, they had to keep the audience's attention. Every second, we had to understand something. Every second, we had to laugh. I was, I said, we had to react. After a while, I think, yeah, what, is, what is there to understand? You know, just let it go. Uh, like a good novel, you, you can read it many ways. Uh, if you, Read Hamlet. You can read it one afternoon one way, and that evening you can read it in a completely different way. There's no one way to think about it. And uh, it's so rare that we have a chance to congregate as a public, and uh, we have that freedom to think. You know, we're not forced into a situation to have to understand something, <laughs> have to respond every second. And I think TV has had a tremendous influence on the way we think that it's every three or four seconds we have to understand what it is the news broadcaster is saying. We have to understand what the situation is. And so that box doesn't give us really uh, that space that we need in our apartments and our houses, uh, the freedom uh, to think. I remember when I first met Lucinda Childs years ago, and I went to her loft on West Broadway, and uh, she was sitting watching uh, the snow on TV, the <laughs> and uh, wow, there was so much space. <laughs> It was so Lucinda, <laughs> uh, watching the static. Uh, and I kept thinking about that when I made Einstein on the beach with Philip Glass and in the beginning there were, were tricks.
Yeah, so uh, in other words, there's a lot to do. And what's the right about it? Really think about, you know, what is behind the box, the surface also. The, what are the inventions, his visions? What is, what, how did he say? The text moves in his, in his work. The images, objects, how does that translate? How do we, we think, how we see the world, write about the world, how do we engage it? Except in the models who are told to us, you mentioned Hannah Arendt, who a famous book, Thinking was our banister, that says the big problem in Germany was that you know, people were listening to someone, holding on to something that wasn't their own, they said you should stand on your own. You should have your opinion. Don't hold on to something that's not yours. Think without it. And that's why she said, you know, these catastrophes happened. Um, this is something Bob teaches us. He famously said, don't sing, sing like Barbara Streisand. He often in the time, everybody wanted to sing like Barbara Streisand. He said, don't, she's great, but don't sing like her. Sing, sing your own song. He said, sing your own song. And sing, you did your own song with your PAJ magazine early on, that way also from the big academic discourse which rewards, you know, the games like often you did different things, so you did your own. So thank you for doing this. You mirror in that way what is working. I think for everybody in the room also is to see what, what does inspire me? What can I break a barrier? Where can I have a vision of something new? But I'll do it because it's authentic, it's original, and I stand for it and I believe in it. So thank you and we head over to Viola. I think I'm introducing our next speaker. So we are half an hour behind, but I think you all that was very much worth it. It's incredible. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Good afternoon. Our next speaker is Marita Testa, who is a set designer for theater performance and the live arts.
Furthermore, Wilson's theater pieces produce a highly specific ordering of this time space, indeed an architecture, which exceed their given frame and reorganize our relation to both the present and historical time. Often Wilson starts his theater projects by defining the time structure and duration. His pieces are given to be seen and heard in a certain order and for a certain and often extended time. His earlier pieces tended to stretch duration towards the physical exhaustion of the performers and certainly to a place of difficulty for certain spectators to endure. Architecture, unlike Wilson's work, has historically, and this is a Western tradition, um, invested in its solidity and permanence. But despite their design and prolonged duration, Wilson's pieces, he reminded us a few nights ago in the context of this conference, faithful to a transit art form, were never meant to last. How is it then that his theater pieces advance into the realm of the architectural? The appraisal of the architectural quality of Wilson's work in the theater has sustainably been echoed and thus continued by critics, reviewers, historians, as well as his frequent collaborators, be it to describe a working method, for example, as theater pieces developed from, quote, architectonic drawings, according to art critic John Howell, for referring to the aesthetics of his civic designs, which were qualified as, quote, totally constructed scenes by performance art historian and curator Rosalie Goldberg, or as a proposition for situating the work's contribution to, to theory history, position, positioning it as a fundamentally, quote, always an act of architecture, according to architect, scenographer, and close collaborator Serge von Marx. As is well known, Wilson's work has typically been received as producing quote unquote slow time, a time produced in function to space to the space of the stage. That is simply to say that the movement of the motion in space organizes spectators' perception of time. In Wilson's work, time is staged as the, as the steady tracking of a performer across the width of the proceeding opening as the sustained development of a single gesture, a relatively small gesture in comparison to the dimensions of the stage and, and that of the audience, which via its display of subtle but incremental change draws the eye and becomes the focus of the scene, or the gradual winning of the psychorama, a take on spatializing duration which has of course become one of the signatures a luminous backdrop, which rather than closing off the space of the stage, seems to further extend it into the horizon. Or as Owen Lau um, thought of yesterday, with the lowering of the... ...which extends beyond the human figure and its stature. I quote, when you turn, the whole universe turns with you, states Wilson, quoting choreography. In Wilson's theater, the scaling of space and that of time together co-produce an open expanse, an effect writer Thierry Meillet described early on in Wilson's career as the sentiment de l'âge. When there is more time, as Bob was telling us, I'm sorry, when there is more space, there is more time to think about other things. The space spared on a seemingly emptier stage just at the time allowed by the prolonged duration of the movement, is offered to the mind of the spectator to inhabit. Wilson also refers to this opening at the, at the distance spanning between the artist and the work, which allows the spectator and their thoughts into the structure of the work. Thus, Wilson's work reclaims the space and time of the theater as a place of insight. We can enter the theater and have time to reflect most importantly, this constructed sense of expanse not only evokes, but effectively creates a realm of possibility. Because more space grants more freedom, a tremendous freedom, that is, that of the space where one can imagine, according to Bob. Therefore, Wilson appreciates emptiness 
of the positive value of the space. During rehearsals for Alice, dramaturg Jan Lingers recounts, the collaborating scenographer had found no time to prepare the scenic, the scenic elements Wilson had expected to see. I am so happy we got rid of all that junk, Wilson explained, thinking that the stage had been emptied as a scenic proposition. Wilson's work allows for the different elements of the theater production to come together and silently challenge each other, creating space around each to be rendered distinctly. Lighting, sets, costumes, and props are foregrounded in the spatial field of tensions that he configures on the stage. And yet, as former literary director of the American Repertory, Repertory Theater, Robert Scanlon beautifully worded, these are, and I quote him here, not allowed to upstage an attention focused on the majesty of unfolding time. By overturning the expectation of the traditionally theatrical, that is to say, by reducing the scale of gesture and movement and seemingly slowing into what he calls natural time. In other words, through landing into stillness and silence, his scenic work crystallizes almost solidifying, if you will, into the real, real, the architectural. Now, I turn the question around. In what ways can we think of his works of architecture as theatrical? It may be that in Wilson's approach, architecture invests in transience rather than permanence, and thus, in its never-ending process of becoming, architecture then turns into a medium akin to the realm of the theater, a theatrical architecture. The Waterman Center, seen as a staging and its architecture as scenography, as the thoughts of those who have spent time here at Fest, takes form in the process of its continual architectural rearrangements of spaces, people, objects, plants, and even living trees. These ongoing spatial transformations architecturally rehearse the material conditions to open an, expand, an expanded world of possibilities. In its earlier stages of development, Wilson described the projected architecture of the center as follows. I see the building simply as a space, a space that is flexible, where anything might happen. It may be said that when encountering the former Western Union Laboratory, Wilson's design approach was that of putting new order to what was already there. As we know, renovating the dilapidated building was considered, but ultimately, a new edifice was built on the foundations of the older one. Wilson rendered the structure of the center distinct by refining the composition of the existing compound into stricter, cleaner, more symmetrical architectural lines. The process of renovation took longer than a decade, a process that former managing director Sue J. Stoffer described as an unending construction, words which inevitably call to mind one of the defining temporal qualities of Wilson's construction of scenic time. Here the work including that of rebuilding here at the center, is always ongoing. Indeed, according to longtime co-director and Christine Roman, the construction, renovation, and rebuilding of this center felt very much like a theater production. The design process included Wilson's sketching, plus an ensemble of architects serving as consultants, whose whose reiterative drafting of architectural plans he directed, meaning Wilson. This cast of architects included um, how this is made. The timeline of construction also included several Bauhoven, a step in the process of design for the theater, wherein the proportions of scenic elements are tested full scale, that is to say, in context. Here, making a reappearance as a method of architectural design, Wilson and his team mocked up to full scale certain elements of their architectural composition. 
For example, taping the size, shape, and spacing between windows of the building facade, or building the volume of the new building. Those well versed in the history of architecture will not find it surprising. For another theatrical architect, none other than Gian Lorenzo Bermini, knocked up the full scale of the columns of Piazza San Pietro prior to signing off on them. The continuous process of designing the Waterfield Center also involves rearranging platters of fruit or moving giant boulders an inch to the right, a placing that any seasoned watermelon knows seldom to be final. If Philip Glass considers the Waterfield Center a class all, a class act all by itself, Nixon Beltran, dancer and longtime manager of the centers, considers it the biggest age, the longest play, and the most unimaginable dance and art installation ever, the living, breathing Robert Wilson masterpiece. I'm almost done. Um, oh, actually, I'm not. <laughs>
really, um, I, I kind of liken it to seeing also a, a one of the large part of human canvas is the mirror uh, of the sublimus, you know, it's, it's this massive scale uh, experience and you start, you can't really parse it immediately, but you try to figure it out. Now I wonder, um, over time, my experience of watermelon has compressed. It has become very familiar as I've lived and worked in it. And I'm, I'm curious how you deal with, uh, and I think you were getting it towards the end of, of, of your paper, uh, that uh, theatrical architecture uh, is perhaps maybe a compression of time as we experience it, or is that is that something that, that you're interested in exploring? And, and you know, how our how uh, our lived experience of these spaces uh, changes our perception of, of time. Questions? If there are no more questions. 
questions, I will introduce the next speaker. Yeah. 
landscape drama. Stein wanted to create a theater that resembled the continuous presence of experience in the landscape, emphasizing the spatial and temporal juxtaposition of visual and oral elements over linear relativity. Parallel to the invention of landscape drama, the creation process in plastic art also gave a landscape-like spatial dimension in the mid-20th century. In the late 40s, when Jackson Pollock revolutionized painting by placing the canvas on the floor and drilling it into paint by being in his picture, he also produced a new space for the act of painting. Harold Rosenberg, the theoretician of abstract expressionism, wrote about this development, quote, the canvas began to appear as an arena in which to act. He went on, the canvas was not a picture, but an event. Rosenberg finally compared the painter to an actor and suggested spectators should think about art as action in terms of sensation, duration, and direction. The foremost art historian, Clement Greenberg, drew a parallel between these two tendencies, between action painters and Gertrude Stein's sensibility in his essay, The Crisis of the Easel Picture. He claimed that as an overall painter, renders every element and every area of the picture equivalent in accent and emphasis, the same logic of equivalence can be applied to Stein's work as well. Where these two parts in art cross each other, we can find the work of Robert Wilson. Theater scholars know the strong connection between Wilson's theater and Stein's landscape drama. We know from Hans D. Lehmann uh, that um, uh, Wilson realized he, he could uh, do theater after reading Stein's Making of Americans. After giving the painting that he had studied from the abstract expressionist George McNeil, in my view, Wilson preserved the energy of the moving body from the process of abstract expressionist creation and, at the same time, replaced the canvas with a stage that became the space of the landscape. However, in my view, Robert was not remained a visual artist whose third theater, the opening up of the canvas into the landscape on the stage, can be seen as a logical answer to the crisis of easel painting. The experience of entering the landscape was by no means new in the history of art, even though it first appeared in a fictive way. In the 1763, Dennis Diderot viewed the painting Landscape with Figures and Animals by Philip Jacques Lutherberg, who later became Eric's stage designer at the Salon. Diderot's enthusiastic critique pressed the composition as if he had entered the pastoral scene of the landscape. 200 years later, this experience will reoccur in the present of three dimensional landscapes. But can we consider Wilson's installations landscapes like this? Godovan introduced the concept of play to conceptualize the mode of being of artwork. There is no space to present the whole theory here. It is enough to remember that in this concept, the subject of play is the play itself, and that the play is determined by the rules and regulations that prescribe how the playing field is built. The play involves the actors and audience as well, all but hearing. The rules of the play, which of course, openness to the part of spectator, is part of the closeness of the play. The audience only completes what the play as such. Finally, Kelomer refers to the process by which human play comes to its true consummation in being art as transformation into structure. Structure here denotes verb, verb, ergo, if you like, an opera. Different rules may construct the place of theater pieces and installations of the same creator. However, if we identify the same structure in both genres within a person's work, we can also recognize the landscape quality in installations regardless of the spectator's position. And the answer is, not only did they find the same rules, but they have also evolved reciprocally and simultaneously, and even converged in the actual landscape of Haftar Mountain in Shiraz in 1972. While some may classify the work I'm referring to as a 
the title referred uh, to H. Wells, the science fiction writer, whose novel Time Machine was 100 years old at that time. This exhibition in London allowed one spectator at the time to engage in time travels within an abandoned desert and prison. The building itself became the main feature uh, of the work. Each room was filled with unrepeatable and was accompanied by Hans Peter Kuhn's soundscape. Robert Johnson's composition technique was really fine in his installation at the Villa Stucke in Munich in 1997. The artist recreated the artworks and personal photos of the house's original owner, art model painter Franz Stuck, in three dimensions. Visitors could explore the life and times of Franz Stuck as they moved through the museum's room. Additionally, he revised the iconography of the stations of the first uh, with his Portland stations uh, installation in Uber in 2000, placing the scenes in Portland houses inspired by Shaker's style, filling them with figures resembling local people and dense networks of new signs and evolutions that provided a mystical experience rather than the traditional market of neo-Nazism. In 2013, the exhibition at the Louvre site of living rooms featured presence surroundings from the Waterman Center. He intervened in the Louvre collection, uh, not in the museum space, but in his new artworks. He created video portraits of like Lady Gaga based on the theme of that, using three paintings from the Louvre, the portrait of Mademoiselle Carolee, Riviera by Lou, Jacqueline David, The Death of Mora, and Andrea Solario's uh, Head of St. John the Baptist. Robert Wilson sees the space as a horizontal line and time as a vertical line. The horizontal line of space, as we can see now, unfolds in the arrangement of the installation's landscape. But what is vertical time, besides um, connection between uh, the center of the earth and the heaven, and how do we encounter it in Wilson's installations? In his interventions, Wilson disrupts the traditional rules of museum displays by challenging the norm of viewing artworks in their frames as independent worlds and reading the installation of artworks as historical narratives. The sense of time for historical um, consciousness is horizontal, that is linear. Past events precede and determine the present. The vertical aspect of time in Wilson's installations can be described as contemporaneous. <coughs> this contemporaneity involves two main elements. Firstly, the simultaneity created by just opposing Wilson's creations and the pieces of the museum collection. And secondly, the observer's act perceiving all components in the installations which brings up the true being of all the artworks in an absolute presence. As Nikaba pointed out in an article on performance and performativity in art, the bridge between performativities here and now and the mental process required in performance is, quote, memory as stage director. This is what makes the viewer a performer. Uh, she also states that uh, this transformation only occurs in the spectator follows the role outlined by the work and acts in, in response to the words addressed in the theory. It is very well uh, The question of memory was also crucial in those most important installation, the installation is memory loss. In his essay, No Stage, in uh, his essay, uh, No Stage, No Actors, but it's theater and art, the prominent curator Robert Storr provided the following phrases uh, on the work, quote, you walk into a room as big as an indoor tennis court, the walls are brick, the floor is cracked sheet of mud, and the far end of the interior, a real window gives out onto another brick wall, puffing in blue light. 
be made of life that he now had both his burden up to his shoulders in the mind. As he's approaching his life as features,
I guess it, uh, Simone Forte said that um, uh, he, uh, she always uh, envied visual art, whether uh, the spectator could uh, watch painting as long as he wanted. And that's why uh, she started to repeat the movement so many times to give the opportunity to the viewer to be able to examine that certain movement um, in that. And uh, I think um, it can be seen in a lot of Robert Wilson's theater piece. But I, I think it's more important in this theater and not in his uh, visual art. Um, since this we have Bob here, can we ask you Bob as the installation and how, how the theater and the installation I think the, all of the work is basically a time-space construction. It's, whether it's a narrative or something totally abstract, you're making decisions in time and space. Architecture is about lines. There are only two. Only two. There's a straight one and a curved one. But do you want many straight ones or all curved ones? Or? I did a few years ago a Verdi's Otello. Verdi opera begins with a storm. It's very loud. In the first act, that's how he begins. And, and it's very quiet. Piano, piano. <clears throat> and I opened it uh, with a seven minute film in silence of an elephant, uh, death of an elephant. And it's uh, very curious having <clears throat> seven minutes with the silent film, the storm was more powerful because we had been sitting there for seven minutes in silence. So you're making decisions. Should this be quicker? Should this be slower? Should this be louder? Rougher? Smoother? It's basically decisions in time and space.
was uh, asked to speak about the collection, and uh, there's many ways to, too many ways to talk about the collection. Um, why is the collection here? Uh, the collection is here for the resident artists in the community, the local community, the national community, and the international community. And I, I think it was the collection is here uh, out of uh, Bob's frustration. Uh, growing up in Waco and even coming to New York City where one had to go to one museum to see design work and another space to see contemporary work and another space to see modernist work and another space to see Renaissance work and another space to see First Nations work and um, and our schools didn't have any art work. Um, other than what was being made at the time. And uh, the institutions like the Met or the Herbert College or the Louvre were supposed to solve that problem by having all mediums, periods, cultures under one roof. But our experience working at the Louvre and curating 650 works from our collection here, there in Paris, is that the divisions between the departments are pretty tall, and it's very difficult to for even those departments to speak to one another. So Bob has uh, created a collection starting from his uh, teen or even preteen years in Waco, and uh, up until today. Uh, about 5,000 works, so 1,000 of which are here on view at the center. And uh, I thought to speak on works that you had seen on the tour earlier today uh, that are right here within view or in an adjacent room uh, rather than anything else. And I wanted to, this um, is a rough outline of a chapter that a book that we're working on on the collection with Bob and Alexander Monroe and with um, a lot of help of Keith McDermott. Um, he knows it or not, but um, <laughs> thanks Keith. And I'm going to start with a small drawing here and we'll see where it goes by Agnes Martin from 1966, which get a sense of scale of work down. It was on the second floor. You might have seen it uh, on your tour earlier today. And so you can see it here. Um, we'll start with that work, which is a pencil on paper, believe it or not, titled The Field, which is written on the front, bottom right, which is rare for Agnes Martin to do, a sign on the back, and owned by um, initially, Sam Wagstaff, who was a curator, collector, and longtime partner of Robert Maplethorpe, and then later it was owned by Donald Judd, and then by Robert Wilson in the Waterloo Center. So I'm going to read from a text of Bob's that Keith helped edit, and uh, Alexander Monroe's also helped with. And this is Bob. I heard Agnes Martin speak at Cooper Union when I was a student at Pratt. She had cropped black hair, wore overalls and big boots, and stood at the podium in silence like a sage, waiting for the right moment until she spoke. She said, there's a monkey standing in the middle of a highway, a mother monkey with a very long tail. The end of the mother monkey's tail was moving violently back and forth while the baby monkey was playing with that tail. We had gone to hear Agnes Martin talk about her paintings and about the art she was talking about, and she was talking about monkeys in the middle of a highway. She then she paused for a long time before she continued. My paintings were all six feet by six feet. I worked with a grid. I marked the edges of the grid, left and right, 
top and bottom. And when she finished this very dry description of how she made a painting, she paused again and then continued. There's a banana tree standing at the corner of a corrugated metal building being beaten by a rainstorm into the metal building. And then she paused. My drawings are very different from my paintings. They're small in scale, but I start the same way. I start with a square and a grid, and I make marks on the edges horizontally and vertically, left and right, top and bottom. It was so amazing to me the way her lecture was structured. She had these descriptions of nature, and then she talked about her work. Pause, a description of nature, pause, her work. I heard her in 1962, and I still remember it clearly. She had such a lasting impression. One of my prized pieces in my art collection is a small grid drawing by Agnes Martin, one of five, and the only one of the five <coughs> where the title, The Field, is written on the front of the drawing. She made the drawings in the 60s, and I wanted one, but at the time, they were $5,000 a piece, and I didn't have $5,000 for a drawing. The next time I saw the drawing was indirectly from Robert Maplethorpe. It was through Robert that I found out Sam Wagstaff had bought the Agnes drawing I had originally wanted. Again, Sam was a curator collector and a longtime partner of Maplethorpe. He paid $15,000. And then Sam Wagstaff died, and Donald Judd bought it for thirty-five thousand. And then Judd died, and I and it went up for sale for fifty thousand dollars. And against the advice of my office, Randall <laughs> Jackson, I bought it. Recently, my office manager came to me and said there had been an offer of two hundred and seventy thousand dollars. for the drawing from a collector in San Francisco. Everyone around me said, sell it. We have to pay the bills. And I said, no, it's not for sale. This is the back of the drawing. And here you can see, return to Donald Trump. <laughs> on Spring Street. In the mid-1960s, I was finishing my studies at Pratt Institute. I was living in Brooklyn on Clinton Avenue. I was planning a kind of happening performance at the Peerless Movie House on Myrtle Avenue. One morning, I was shopping at a supermarket near the movie house, and I met by chance Bob Maplethorpe. At that time, he was known as Bob, not Robert, and I asked him if he would liked to be in my production, and he agreed. And this is Bob here on the far left with his arm raised. And that's Robert Maplethorpe with his arm raised. The Pyrrhus. Robert went to Pat Pratt while I was there. He wasn't a photographer yet. In those, days, in those days, he was doing collage, very sweet, little collages. We were sort of friends, and we saw each other from time to time. Then Robert, sorry, sorry, this is, uh, let me go back. We were sort of friends, and we saw each other from time to time. And then Robert met Sam Wagstaff, they became lovers, and Sam began to promote Robert as a photographer. In 1975, I was performing a letter for Queen Victoria. I met Paul Walter, who was a friend of Sam Wagstaff, and then we began to see each other frequently with Sam and Robert. I had acquired my loft at 147 Spring Street in 1965. Several years after that, Donald Judd acquired his studio on Spring Street. Julie Finch used to 
home to my loft where we had open houses and people danced freely. She was married to Joe, and I met him at the time. He came on different occasions to the open houses on Spring Street, and I visited him in his studio a few blocks away. When he was at 140 Springs, 147 Spring Street, he said, I admire the way you organize space around you. When I saw Judd's studio, I realized we both had a formal sense of order. Years later, when I was making I Sun on the Beach, he told me he was fascinated, that he didn't particularly like what I had done, but was fascinated by the visual structure of the work. I always liked what Richard Serra said when Judd died. Individually and collectively, we all put our head into Judd's box. That was from Sarah's obituary of Judd, published in our form. And these are other works in the Mornwell Center collection, which you might have seen on the tour in the adjacent room on your left. Some of the last furniture pieces that Judd did in Brazilian mahogany. A print which is in the apartment on the other wing. An early woodblock print, a very important piece which is in our residence building across the south lawn. All of that had an impact on the visual structure of Einstein. Paul Walter gave for me as a present for my birthday in October of 1975 a photo of Einstein at Princeton. After, and after studying the photo, I realized that in all the photos I have of Einstein as a boy, four or five years old, as a teenager, as a man in his 20s, and then later in life, he always held his hand in the same way, with a little space between his thumb and the index finger. I began to imagine it was the space where he held the chalk to do his calculations, the space where he played the violin and pulled the ropes for a sailboat, which were his favorite pastimes. For the costumes of Einstein, I used that photograph. Everyone was dressed in black and white tennis shoes like he wore, gray baggy pants, starched white shirts, suspenders, and a wristwatch. And to their sides with a little space between the thumb and the index finger. Einstein was constructed in the three traditional ways of looking at paintings, portraits, still lives, and landscapes. If you see something close up, you can say it's a portrait. If you see something further away, you can say it's a still life. But if you go even further, it's part of the landscape. Einstein was constructed in four acts and three scenes, A, B, C, portraits, still lives, and landscapes. For the portraits, the knee plays were closest to the audience. The performers were sitting in a small white square to the lower right side in front of a gray curtain. A white square in front of a gray curtain. Furniture for Cheryl Sutton and Lucinda Childs I built out of plumbing pipe. Einstein said if he had to live his life over again, he'd rather be a plumber. This is a bowl from the collection, Persian bowl. Bob used something similar from the Middle East for the clock in Nine Sound on the Beach. And this piece is in the uh, North Wing. When Einstein was opening in 1976, Vogue magazine wanted to photograph Phil and I. Robert Mapleford found out about it and wanted to be the photographer. At that time, he was not very well known, and folks said they weren't sure about Mapleford. 
I was asked if I could suggest someone else. I suggested Horst be Horst. In the long run, Horst photographed me without film. Robert was furious. Before the opening of Einstein, I commissioned Robert Mablethorpe to take photos of Phil and myself, and we used them for publicity photos. I always liked Robert's work because it's classical in its construction, very formal. This was a photograph in the artist's book, and Roland said, Bob Wilson holds me, though I cannot say why. It's a photograph of Lucinda Childs by Robert Mapplethorpe during Einstein. See another one right up here on the far left. And a exhibition of Lucinda's in an adjacent room, covering Einstein, patio, and a few other productions. This is Lucinda's schematic drawing, which in many ways reminds me of Agnes's. This is that drawing transposed into a neat, into a neat play. Spaceship scene. The field dance. The field. Christopher Knowles photographed by Robert Mapplethorpe at the time of Einstein on the beach, which you can see here upstairs. And works of Christopher Knowles in our collection. One of the great artists, living artists, Christopher Knowles. Maybe I'll be there. 
I had to get on a plane. It was in my car about to drive off to the airport. And she came rushing up to the car window and said, so what do you think? About what? About my work? I think you're a genius. And I drove off. She came to Houston as my date for Parsifal. It was the first time she'd seen an opera, and while we were watching, she leaned over to me and said, it's very long. <laughs> How much longer do I have to stay? <laughs> I went back to see her three times, and at the end of her life, she'd moved from Galisteo to Taos and was living in a home for elderly people. I called to ask, if I could come and see her, and she said, okay, don't be late. I go to my studio at 11. I said, can I pick you up and take you to your studio? She said, no, she'd meet me there. She had a big Mercedes that she loved to drive. When I arrived at the studio, she was already there waiting. We were talking small talk. She said, you know, Bob, I don't know, how, I don't know why I lived all my life alone in Galisteo. Now I live in a home with other people. I don't know why I always lived alone. What did you, what did you do today, Agnes? Well, I woke up at 4.30. I had breakfast at quarter to seven. I said, Agnes, what did you do from 4.30 to quarter to seven? Did you meditate? No, she said, I sat.
revolving around politics, I think on uh, George Floyd's life on West Terrace. So we're, we're, that, that's a beautiful thing about water is that it, it's, uh, it can react and move pretty quickly. Um, and another question. Um, well, building a, for all of us, I think a house, a house of mankind, a, a memory machine, the machine itself, in kind of a beautiful, perfect setting, very abstract, but also completely free, in opposites. It's astonishing. Uh, the whole studio that the collaborators said that in our conference, our, there's total freedom in the but yet it's so precise and controlled. So when you bring Bob's work, let's say, for the Louvre or another structure, how do you make it work? I mean, what is important? Yeah, I mean, we make it work by working hard. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the only thing that I can, you know, you do one thing and then another and then another. It's hard to, uh, each, each context is different and each project is different. I mean, this wall, we put up, you know, we put those up in two days. You painted it over, I think. Yeah, and transformed the room. And, it's a team effort. It's the only way that it gets done. Yeah, maybe we can ask Bob about, it. for example, the like Louvre installation. This was monumental. How, how how did you do it? What did you think about it? In the very beginning of the Louvre Museum, they showed uh, artist studios. And um, so I was asked to than to do something, and I think they had in mind to, uh, that I would make a theatrical work. And uh, I thought to start with my apartment here, so I duplicated it at the Louvre Museum. And I wanted to, at the time, I had just met um, Lady Gaga. Said to Gaga uh, that perhaps we could do something in the Louvre Museum. And Gaga was uh, 26 at the time, and she was, I said, maybe we can do something for your 27th birthday. And so that I'd like to do a performance that'd be 27 hours long. <laughs> so I proposed it, and in the meantime, the director of the Louvre. Um, changed, and the new director, Mr. Martinez, uh, said uh, the Louvre uh, is not a place for Gaga. It should be the Santa Monica. And um, so, uh, again, as Noah said, uh, my idea is that under one roof there could be many different views, uh, different ways of looking at art and uh, collection. For and my apartment uh, reflected that, but I also wanted to have a creation. And, uh, so as it turned out, they, they said no to Gaga doing a performance, and we tried in the city of Paris to do something in a balcony from the Louvre that would be then governed by the city in the courtyard. And, uh, that didn't work out, so I made these portraits of her, and because they were based on the collection of the Louvre Museum and her classical uh, Martinez allowed it to be seen, so then I made twenty-something portraits of Gaga. It was extraordinary. Is that this woman who I was known for? As a pop star, I did an MTV award with her. She changed her clothes in uh, two minutes and 23 seconds, nine times. So, uh, but here she stood for hours in one position. And uh, this is an amazing artist. The interior concentration amazing. And the portrait we saw here, uh, one of them that we showed, uh, uh, 
she would <clears throat> take two and a half, three hours for makeup. And then she, we did the, in the portrait of Laura. Uh, she would look at uh, the, the photo of reproduction of Mara. And then she would check it in terms of looking at a video monitor of her image and make corrections. And then again, she <clears throat> would look back at the uh, reproduction of the portrait of Mara, and then she would say, OK. And then we would shoot it. She was in stillness. So here was someone who understood as we were talking about earlier today of looking at this oak tree here and there are crypts, these trees that are slightly moving. Uh, the life that is in stillness. And, uh, she knows stillness. Ezra Pound said he was when he was in Pisa. He said, in the fourth dimension is stillness and the power of a wild beast. Thank you, and um, thank you, Bob. Um, now we come to, I think, our last speaker. Um, shortly before we will go up and somehow celebrate the opening of the archive, the Wilson Archive, which is a big honor. And I think also really a cause for celebration. It was also part of the idea to do it now. We now have with us Clifford Allen. Yes. Clifford is a writer, an archivist, a scholar, historian, and concert presenter living in Hudson Valley, and also a great connoisseur of jazz, I think. From 2013 until the end of 2023, for 10 years, which is a long time, watermelon years, because they time, they time seven each year. So he was the lead archivist and director of archives for the watermelon Center. Clifford, tell us a little bit about the archive. Well, I thought that we would go over there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, so the archives have moved from uh, a home in, mostly in New York City uh, on West 29th Street. Uh, you can imagine that uh, building being at one time kitty corner to Caroline Schneemann's loft and around the corner from uh, a, a rehearsal in the Flower District, a rehearsal room where many uh, great jazz musicians played in the 1950s and 60s. So it was really a fascinating, fascinating nexus of things in Chelsea slash south of Midtown. Uh, but Watermill is a really wonderful soil from which uh, Bob's work and so many other creative artists' work has, has sprung for many, many years, going back to the late 80s and early 1990s. However, the archives themselves, uh, Bob's work and the Watermill Center were not here. So it was always very difficult for scholars to try to, uh, they had to bisect themselves almost between Watermill uh, and New York City, and, or trisect themselves if we want to include Bohemia, New York, where uh, many of the archives were in storage. So a lot of that material is now here with us, and we are able to uh, help artists and scholars and researchers uh, explore both the history of this place and the history of the work that both has inhabited and preceded it, uh, as well as uh, you know, advance and, and, and test out their own uh, artistic process, both through the collections, through the archives, through the space, uh, and uh, as we learned yesterday, through digital platforms, which we won't discuss so much today, uh, but we'll look through the physical imprint of Bob's archives and the Watermill Center's archives here at the Watermill Center. So follow me. One, one question before we go. Yeah. The space was made for those who created the artist's guest house before the artists were actually sleeping oh, yes. in the room. Good point. And, and, and can you just tell us, because we won't have the mind, what is the state of the archive? We're going to officially we open it. Where are we in the process? Where are we now? Well, where are we now? Is it? It's a great question. So uh, the production archives, at least through uh, 2019, early 2020, going back to 1962, 
processed. Uh, we have the Robert Wilson production papers and photographic records, the physical photographic records of most of his productions uh, in the archives. The Bird Hoffman School of Birds archives are processed and could be really being added to. Uh, we also have uh, exhibition and lecture materials uh, processed and, and available of uh, catalog and finding aids. We also have quite a number of the Citra archives and uh, accruals of recent material available in, in process, but we're still working on it. So yeah, I, I like to say that we are, are at a nice, beautiful midway point so that the next uh, next archivist, uh, next scholars can really uh, advance this you know, a bit further. So, but it's in a beautiful, really beautiful spot right now. And soon our process will can apply to the waterfall as residents, so check out the updates of the waterfall. And now we follow up 